Great. We are ready to go. Very warm welcome. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. I'm director of the Institute for Government. And um, it's very good to have here the buzz that attends a very, very uh, good event and one that a lot of people have been looking forward to, including our panel. Thanks very much indeed for coming. I'm delighted to have here today to uh, discuss the, the, the government's proposed constitution on, uh, uh, sorry, the government's proposed commission on the Constitution. <laughs> Freudian didn't slip, and it would be uh, jumping ahead of where we might get to even in this event, on, on the Constitution, on rights, on democracy. Um, for people who've been looking at this from many different angles, we have Kath Haddon, senior fellow here, who's been writing about it uh, extensively and about to write more. Jonathan Sumption, Lord Sumption, Supreme Court Justice from 2012 till 2018, and uh, among many things that he has written, also gave the Wreath Lectures last year, where he set out, in his view, uh, where the law arguably had uh, taken over from the realm of, of politics, something that many of his legal uh, colleagues then uh, decided to respond to. Gisela Stewart, who was for 20 years MP for Birmingham Edgebaston and is now chair of many things, Wilton Park, but also a member of the Constitution Reform Group, a group looking at uh, these, these kind of questions and arguing to save the, uh, the union, and was, of course, uh, head of vote leave in, in its day, and is going to be arguing about some of the things that the Constitution Reform Group has put together on this. And Gina Miller, known to many of you, um, in one of her two main roles, but as challenging the government successfully twice uh, on its uh, conduct of, of Brexit, um, and also as one of the founders of SCM, where, um, an ethical-based uh, fund management group really pushing on the question of transparency in fund management. Anyway, thank you very, very much indeed for joining us. and for embarking on these questions. We're really, we, we, we've got a few simple questions. They're all gonna start off and then we will um, tease apart this, this, this question. But it's really, at first, uh, what might be in the government's uh, commission when it gets going, if it gets going, and what should be in it and what should not be in it. Um, and let's, um, let's see where that takes us. I know there's going to be a lot of questions and I'll try and leave good time for them. Without that, Kath, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, so there's two very big questions that I think the government needs to answer about this commission. Uh, firstly, what it's going to cover, obviously, uh, but also how it's going to work. And we, at the moment, we've got very little to go on on either of those. On what it's going to cover. Now, we can go back to the manifesto, remembering, of course, that manifesto commitments don't necessarily tell us what the government, now with its huge majority, might want to do. Um, but they've got a real mixed bag of ideas in there. There's everything from the functioning of the royal prerogative, the role of the House of Lords, the relationship between government, parliament and the courts, and access to justice. It also talks, though, about updating the Human Rights Act, reform of judicial review, and the ability of the security services to defend us against terrorism and organised crime. Obviously a very topical issue at the moment. The problem is that a commission that covers all of those things would be rather confused. Lots of it relates to the role of the courts in the justice system, but other aspects like the Lords have had their own commissions in the past, all on, their, on its own. But then we need to remember, though, that the government have also said that there's other things they want to do anyway outside of the commission. So uh, a good example is a fixed-term Parliament Act, where the government has said that they want to repeal that. So the question is, how is it going to then look at the royal prerogative when it is already in the flux of making changes to that. If it seeks to do changes to judicial review, uh, again, outside of the Commission, how does that affect how it then looks at both access to justice on the one hand and the relationship between courts and, par and parliament and government on the other side? But the other thing is with this Commission in terms of what might be in scope, what might be out of scope, is the things that the government have in the manifesto at least, ruled out. It said that it doesn't support changes to the electoral system. It wants to retain first past the post. That obviously implies that electoral reform is going to be out of the question, but calling something a democracy right and constitution commission implies that it would be able to get into sort of all of these areas. So the danger is then that you end up with a rather sort of hodgepodge of ideas going into this. 
But I think the bigger question is actually how the government goes about it. Uh, my colleague Raphael Hogarth, who's an associate here, had a really good line on this earlier today. He said, either the government know the answer or they want to ask the question. Uh, it's got to be one or the other. If the government already knows some of these changes it wants to do around the role of the courts, possibly even the role of the Supreme Court, then a commission could be undermined from the outset. Who they choose as chair, uh, who are the panel members, the terms of reference, even what kind of public engagement, is there a citizens' assembly, how long it would run, all of these things are going to be really closely examined so that people try and guess what the government's intentions are. And remember, the UK does not have the best track record for commission-led constitutional reform. They often take a lot of time, uh, but the government then having moved on politically and sometimes even in terms of personnel, can lose interest uh, or don't want to implement the conclusions that follow. So that's going to be a big question. And this is a time when aspects of our constitution are in flux anyway. A big area I've not mentioned yet is devolution. But with ongoing Brexit, with the relationship being as it is at the moment between Westminster and the devolved governments, will a commission like this be able to look at those issues when changes are already happening? Uh, and the government have said that the purpose is to restore trust in our institutions and in how our democracy operates. That kind of implies that there's going to be some kind of public participation to this, that he would allow something that is sufficiently wide-ranging to really get into some questions at the heart of our constitution and our democracy. But again, if that takes two years to operate, what does that mean for how it then in this commission engages with the government during that process? How cross-party is it and how long-lasting are these reforms going to be? So I think there's really, it has to decide between two options. One is a narrower commission that could help the government explore an issue it really wants solved. Perhaps that is judicial review. But then it needs a tighter scope and it needs clear support from the government if actually it's going to come up with solutions that the government might then implement. The biggest risk, though, I think, is that we end up with some kind of poorly defined commission, terms of reference and makeup of a panel that seem to predetermine the results, and a government that then doesn't want to wait for a reply. I think this would be a massive shame. It's a really important constitutional moment. That, you know, there is a lot of interest in our constitution in some of these really big questions. Um, a poorly designed commission would be a waste of resources and I think would be a wasted opportunity. Yeah, thanks very much indeed for taking us to the heart of some of these questions, including whether the government is intending this as a, um, a way of getting uh, various constraints on its power uh, out of the way, or whether it intends a serious look at loose ends, if you like, uh, raised or created by the past couple of years. And, and just to emphasize that we're going off what they've said in their manifesto. Mm. There's been nothing else since then. Jonathan. Well, uh, I think, uh, perhaps unfashionably, that our constitution has weathered the problems of the last three years remarkably well. Um, so where does that leave the commission? I think just looking at general points first, I think first of all it's important that the commission should not be hidebound by the political disputes of the last three, three and a half years. We've spent that long ask, uh, looking at every constitutional change in the light of the question, does this advance or retard Brexit? Uh, it is utterly absurd for us to consider constitutional change simply in the light of particular issues. They have merit or lack of lack merit on their, on their own strength. Or, uh, secondly, uh, the Commission, I think, uh, needs to be bi bi bipartisan. Uh, it should be neutral or balanced. Otherwise, its achievement will not last very long because it will be rejected by a substantial part of the political community and sooner or later uh, is likely to be reversed. So it should not regard it as its function uh, as being to uh, simply give effect to the political program uh, of one party. Um, uh, thirdly, I think it's got to look uh, at constitutional issues over the long term. That's implicit in both of the previous points. So what are the issues? First of all, I think the electoral system, the government has made its own position clear, but I do not see how any constitution commission worthy of the name can avoid looking at what is actually fundamentally the mechanism uh, by which the people uh, determine what sort of government they have. Uh, so that if the object uh, is to um, uh, uh, restore trust, uh, 
I do not think that you can ignore the electoral system. Uh, secondly, I think one needs to look again at the whole question of referenda, at the kind of questions that referenda uh, seek to answer, and in particular, one needs to consider uh, whether we should adopt the practice which is embodied in the constitutions of most countries that provide in their constitution for referenda, uh, under which uh, you only have referenda uh, to say yes or no to a precise legislative proposal which is capable of coming into effect immediately upon the relevant consent being obtained. Uh, thirdly, I think we need to look at the role of the monarch. The monarch has made it clear over a number of years that she does not wish to do anything politically controversial, but we do need to have an ultimate constitutional arbiter, as every republic has and as many monarchies such as the Dutch monarchy have, to deal with problems like the selection of the um, prominent prime minister uh, in a, a hung parliament and other issues of that kind. Um, uh, uh, finally, uh, I think that we do need to have a look at the relations between the courts on the one hand and both the executive and the legislature uh, on the other. Uh, I think that aspects of judicial review do give rise to problems uh, and uh, so do aspects of the Human Rights Act. So that would be my agenda. Thank you very much. And um, of the first three things you said, uh, they're not ones on the government's agenda as we understand it. The final one uh, absolutely is of the relation between courts, legislature and, uh, uh, and the government. But of, of the first ones, just briefly on the electoral system, what do you think a commission uh, should look at, even if this one doesn't? I think that they need to look uh, at whether some form of proportional representation uh, should replace first past the post. I know this isn't the government's policy, and one test of whether this is simply something to rubber stamp the government's policy uh, or a serious inquiry into our constitution will be whether they write that out of the agenda. Um, I, I personally don't think much of the alternative vote system. I think that some form of uh, proportional representation would have the advantage that at a time when compromise uh, is extremely difficult to achieve within political parties uh, as a result of dwindling membership roles and growing extremism. Uh, it may well be that the time has come to look at a system uh, under which compromise would uh, necessarily have to occur between parties. I suspect many people here might be interested in that, but as this is a government that has just won a majority of, of 80, I suspect that they're not among those. Um, so we might have to devise another test for whether or not this is a rubber stump, because I, I can confidently predict that it's going to fail that one. I think it will fail <laughs> quite a number of tests. <laughs> we'll, 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 come on, we'll come on to the others. Gisela. Um, I thought Kath very interestingly opened this when she said either know the answer or you know what is the question, to which my first note I made here is saying, why, why did they put this in the manifesto? Uh, I mean, given that this was a manifesto written in a hurry, an election that was meant to be very f tightly fought on the issue of Brexit and not on any other policies in the manifesto, it is interesting that it was even mentioned. So I think for the purposes of, uh, we, we can cut out a lot of empty debate until we know why they put it there in the first place and I think it's going to become uh, quite soon clear uh, as to what, what the, as the lawyers would say, what was the, the what is it they're trying to find the remedy to? Um, but I want to talk about the Constitutional Reform Group on the basis uh, that uh, the overarching thing for us, and this is what I think they need to look at, is actually to keep the United Kingdom Union together. And before any of you make some cheap jibe of saying, have, having, having just spent three and a half years campaigning to take us out of one union, what is this union to you? Uh, I, in my defense, I would say that we started this work well before uh, the, the referendum was even called. We came together in about 2015, and it includes people from Ming Campbell to Robert Salisbury to Peter Hain to now the first uh, ministers, former ministers of, of Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. It's about as broad a church as you can imagine, and it's not a campaign group. But we came about from the fact that uh, devolution, which started uh, in, in a serious way uh, with the 97 Blair government, and uh, giving more powers to Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and, and, and London as, as a metropolitan, you ended up very much with being England and, 
how, how is England represented in that relationship to be an, an, an unanswered question. Um, I, we went to see David Cameron uh, after we sort of done the first draft, and I remember seeing him together with Min Campbell and uh, Robert Salisbury in, in March, in, in the March of that he had already called the referendum. And he got quite agitated and he said, why do you care about this? And I remember saying to him, because Prime Minister, whatever the outcome of the referendum, you're the Prime Minister of a deeply fractured union. Uh, and I think that unless we begin to answer the question of who speaks for England and what is the devolution or settlement of England in relationship to, to the rest of the whole, I don't think we, we will find an answer. And, and, and arguably, uh, I would say that probably part of the, the Brexit referendum was the unanswered question of who speaks for England. Because London is the capital. Uh, Westminster down there is the, is, 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 you know, the, the, the national institution. Uh, and it's only been very recently that people like John Denham down in Winchester started to look at English nationalism, uh, looking at uh, could you have an English parliament? And remember, it is a really bizarre notion that we, we regard Scottish nationalism as being outward-looking, trendy, progressive, all wonderful. And the minute someone says an English parliament, they're going to, oh dear, you know, this is everything the opposite. So I think there's a bit of rethinking. So what we've got is, uh, anybody who wants to pursue this for this act of, uh, it's, it's an act of union bill. And it's the three things you need to take away from that. It's, it's starting point. Is a, is a complete reversal of the power structure. Everything is devolved other than that what is not. So you actually define the, central, the, the powers of the centre. And why that is an, an, an important question uh, post-Brexit is because the, the question of how powers over fishery, agriculture, and all those other things which are returning to the centre, how that is dealt with will be a live political question. Uh, we also realise that people get terribly hung up on their pet subjects. So the minute you mention the House of Lords in there, everybody's interested in this document because they've got their favourite version of what should happen to the House of Lords. So on the two pet subjects, one is the House of Lords and the other one was happening to the question of England, we actually offer two versions. So you could uh, abolish the House of Lords completely, you could have House of Lords limited in numbers, part elected, part, part appointed, two terms of ten years, I personally have reached the point that I don't care anymore how you get into the House of Lords, as long as it's not for life. But you know, I'm, I'm uh, probably uh, very minimalist. We look at, at England and we look at the two options which go, you either have an English Parliament or you've got greater devolution, uh, city regions and how that works. Again, these are questions which the government at some stage or another will have to answer. The key thing I would really advise against if you're looking at a new constitutional settlement, which I think we have to come to, it, do not go around and have your little building blocks and get obsessed about them. Is this a purist federal structure? No, of course it isn't. You can't have a purist federal structure if one component is 50 odd million and the other one, you know, it, it, even, even in Germany it didn't work until you've broken up Prussia. Uh, so it's, as long as the government, in it, the way it looks at the constitution, it realizes it requires an overarching system which takes power down to much lower levels than it is now. And that England can actually learn quite a lot from Scotland and Wales for once and ought to have the humility to do so. Then I think the individual steps which you may get to, and I hope the government will get to some of these individual steps, may end up which is something by far more holistic. This country does not have a tradition of structured constitutional settlements because it doesn't have the history. You know, if you look at the, the historic ones, you know, it just, it's been organically grown. And by the way, in that context, I would really recommend to you if you have not re-listened to the Reese lecture several times over, because the first time you don't quite get it. Uh, you, I would, uh, you could always. Uh, I think that was a compliment. I, I, I think you can you can still get the book and read that too. Uh, and I think we we would all learn of some of those insights. So, overarching whatever they think, because some of these things are going to hit them. We are working now. We are, we are planning on a, a new bill which will come with a new parliament where we flesh out more the work on how the flow of finances will go. But I think whatever the government intends with its commission, it will have to address some of these things whether it likes it or not.
All right. uh, thank you very much. What's, what's the it will have to in that? Because um, you've, um, you've eloquently set out um, some of the questions about devolution, which indeed we're, we're working on here, which many people think are essential, but from these uh, gestures in the manifesto, uh, the government does not seem to be heading that direction. Might with the Lords, probably not with devolution. So what's, what's, what's going to force it, in your view? Well, I think, that, I think there are three drivers which are going to hit them. The, the first one was, which I already said, about when, when powers like fisheries and agriculture come back. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how, how do you, you know... Are they devolved uh, or not? Uh, devolved or not. The second one is you will have the next round of mayor elections. Yep. Uh, this and of course the cover of the, the, the coverage of, of, of England with city deals and open brackets. What are they going to do with the wretched police crime police commissioners? Uh, you will end up with an asymmetric function, and you will have bits of England left out. Mm. We, what are you going to do with those bits? And I think the third one is that the, the rather dodgy compromise called evil, I think very appropriately called e evil, this English vote for English laws, which is completely half-baked. I mean, that will come to a point where they have to go and revisit that. So these are things, so three right. flashpoints. All right, well, 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 we'll come back to those um, possibly as well. Uh, Gina, your take on this. Um, I feel a bit of an imposter being here with so many experts in the room and in the audience. But um, as somebody who has been keenly involved, um, I'm going to address the questions that were sent by the organisers today. I mean, the first one was, what are the most important constitutional issues facing the country? Well, to me, I think the potential breakup of the union um, and the sort of seeking legal redress to call a, a, a India referendum, number two. Um, the review of the Fixed-Term Parliament Act, I think, is going to be something that uh, is of constitutional importance. The working in the review of the judiciary, and in particular, you know, the terms of reference and locus of, of Supreme Court, which I can't still quite figure out if it's revenge or reform, um, but replacement of the Human Rights Act with the British Bill of Rights. Um, the Boundary Commission, which we haven't mentioned, is, is a, a constitutional issue. Um, and the size and composition of any future House of Lords and where that might sit, or if indeed there is a House of Lords and what a successor might look like. Um, in terms of how could the Commission help to address any of these issues, I think it's got to be about scope. You know, it's sort of at the moment, it's a committee in search of a cause, it almost feels like, in that uh, there's been li very little that's been said about the scope. I mean, we might see that in, in, in weeks to come, but uh, I think a, a set of parameters um, would be interesting to see, desirable to see. Um, also, you know, how is it going to be the composition of it? I think, uh, as Lord Tum uh, Sumption said, it's about the uh, non-partisan nature of, the, of it. Um, but also it's issues about how it's going to be funded. I mean, this is, uh, you know, establishing the principles and uh, uh, thinking about constitutional reform is one thing, but it does take time and resources. Um, and, you know, is it, is it going to have the necessary resources to do the job that is required because it's such a huge question. Um, and I think it's, it's also about the time frame, as we've talked about, are the government politically going to find that it's not in their interest? At the moment, they're playing to a particular gallery. So, you know, to that public gallery, it's very important as we've just come through the last few years. But are we going to be in the same position in 12 months, 24 months time? Um, and then if it, all of that does happen, if the conclusions or recommendations are things that the executive find politically unpalatable, then are they actually going to uh, want to listen to the, um, pr those rep recommendations? Um, and then I also worry about you know, how independent are the witnesses going to be, because that will colour what the outcomes are, is the quality and independence of the evidence that's given in front of that committee. So I think um, it's, it's wide, we don't know quite. I just want to say something about judicial review because that's a bit, I think, for me personally, um, I, I worry about because, um, you, you know, we have a, uh, when you have a hung parliament, you have a constitution that's being tested. We don't have that now. We have a majority, sound majority government. So I can't quite understand why the urgency, because I would argue actually there needs to be an increase in judicial review rather than a, um, a, you know, a constra construct, um, constraining of it. Because don't forget the judicial review is not just used for what the government sees as being political actions, which were not political actions, but we won't go there, um, go back there. It's also, you know, think about Hillsborough, 
You know, think about what judicial review has been used in its widest, um, you know, you think about the Hillsborough case, think about the um, officer who took her life um, and the reopening of that inquiry, the young uh, uh, youth, the woman soldier. Think about the woman who was entitled to council housing for her children and then told her she couldn't because she was made herself voluntarily homeless and that was open to judicial review. Judicial review is not just about political questions. And I do worry about this attack on judicial review and what will that mean to social justice in its widest form. Trina, thank you very much. And I'm gonna pick up exactly from that point and go on. We've got all kinds of uh, things now on the table of what uh, uh, the country's problems and might be in such a, a commission in the, in the views of our panelists um, from union questions. I, uh, my colleagues at the Institute very much agree with um, Gisela that uh, uh, these questions are going to thrust themselves um, in the government's, uh, to the government's attention, whether it wants it or not. Uh, we've got other things like the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, where we think uh, the, the government's likely to deal with it separately. We have Boundary Commission. We have a, a electoral commission, um, electoral uh, procedure questions. We have the Lords. But all these things are probably, even though this, this is probably not going to be in the bucket that the government is constructing to put things in. What I want to just return us to before we come to questions is uh, Lord um, Sumption's fourth point, the relationship between the government, the judiciary and, um, and parliament. And, um, and picking up the point that Gina was just making about judicial review. And I just wanted to dig into this a bit because this is really one of the key questions we're here and why people are suspicious of this talk of a commission, whether it is really the government trying to get back at various uh, attempts um, or moves in the courts and so on um, to constrain its power and whether this is, and commission is in fact going to have a narrow and vindictive uh, air to it or might actually be something more neutral um, looking at these questions. Um, so what would you, again, like to see in this, in this particular area of your fourth point? Well, I think a lot of the debate um, uh, confuses, it lumps under the broad heading judicial review um, a, a number of different issues. Uh, I think that the circumstantial evidence is quite strong, but page 48 of the Conservative Party manifesto, uh, when it talked about um, uh, reigning in judicial review, was mm. talking about the kind of case that Gina Miller brought on two occasions to the Supreme Court. Um, there is a world of difference between the courts intervening uh, to preserve the decision-making power of Parliament, which was the basic issue in both of Gina Miller's judicial review cases, uh, and cases in which the, uh, the courts <coughs> are being invited uh, to set aside uh, ministerial uh, decisions. Uh, one is a question of the conflict, potential conflict between Parliament and the courts, and the other is potential conflict between the executive and the courts. Looking at the relations between the executive and the courts, I think that you have got to distinguish between two different things there too. Um, first of all, there are cases where um, the government acts illegally or lacks the legal power to do something. Uh, I cannot imagine what kind of legislation uh, would have the effect that if the government uh, acts illegally or, or without the power to do something, uh, the courts are expected to stand aside and do absolutely uh, nothing about it. Um, <clears throat> uh, what would such an act say? If the government acts illegally for high political reasons, the courts must not intervene. If the government has no power to do something, it may do it anyway if it wants to do it uh, for high political reasons. The distinction in the Prime Minister's recent statement in the House of Commons between uh, cases where uh, judicial review uh, and uh, it is politics by other means and cases where it defends uh, the citizen against oppression. Uh, there is a point there, but it's actually quite difficult to draw. Um, to my mind, the real problem is a much more intractable one, which is that the courts have developed a mass of jurisprudence which has very greatly expanded the scope of what can be regarded as illegal. Um, they have um, <coughs> basically treated uh, any breach of certain 
judicially created norms uh, as giving rise to a situation where the government's act is ultra varies. Um, there is an important difference between cases where the government simply doesn't have the power to do something at all and cases where it does have the power to do it uh, but does it on principles that the courts disapprove of. Now it's really in that last area that I think that there is a potential problem uh, about judicial review. Uh, I do not think it's an easy one to solve because you cannot have an act of parliament that says judges must in future be more careful not to trespass on the prerogatives of parliament or ministers. Uh, the only way in which I think you can really make a, 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 a significant difference in that area uh, is to either go through every power the government has got and enlarge it, which would have serious problems, um, if the government is given unlimited power, then it will never be acting without power. But I rather doubt whether that's feasible. The only alternative is, in my view, uh, to uh, replace the entire body uh, of uh, common law on uh, public law uh, by a codified system, effectively to start again. The, the whole structure of public law is very ancient, it's very complicated, and it's open to a great deal of informal expansion in individual decisions and if the government is serious about wanting to curtail judicial review in those cases where it really does trespass uh, on matters for which ministers should be responsible to parliament I think that the only way of doing it is to rewrite public law on different and codified principles. This is one of the things that you were setting out in the Reith lectures and one of the reasons why many of your legal colleagues seem to have a great deal to say in response. A, a certain way to offend large numbers of lawyers is to say <laughs> that lawyers should have less power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it worked. Go ahead. Yeah, no, go on. Can, can just add, um, I've paid by far more attention to page 69 of uh, Lord Sumption's book than page 48 of the Party Manifesto. And I, I thought where you put the problem very succinctly is we're facing two rival conceptions of democracy. One, a constitutional mechanism for arriving at collective decisions and accommodating dissent. And the second one, which is the bit which caught my attention as a politician, a system of values where the choices of elected representatives are only legitimate within the limits allowed by predefined set of political values. So the German Democratic Republic could call itself the German Democratic Republic because it defined its values which were unquestionable. And of course, if the minute you codify your set of values, you limit the maneuver of the politicians. Uh, and that's why I think that we don't know why the, the Conservative Party put that into its manifesto, but I don't get the feeling that they would do anything which would limit their info maneuver. Can I just pick up this point about a biddable judiciary? Because one of the things we haven't spoken about yet is this idea that uh, you know, the Prime Minister would be given three names um, uh, for him to, to choose. And, this, uh, and also the fact that potential candidates would go before a select committee Can who would review their for. views. Views on what? Yeah. I mean, you know, this is, uh, you, you look at yeah. around the world, and I do worry about this move towards a biddable judiciary. I mean, you know, Orban used the same language. You know, you have to worry. And, and that's where I think we should all be very aware of the idea. I mean, that, that bit, the, the, the choosing of the judiciary does worry me. Hmm. Yes, I think you're right to worry about it. Um, and, and I also think that you're right to say that the oddity of this notion of uh, political ap appointments or political confirmations can be seen by asking the question, what would you ask of candidates? Mm -hmm. Would you ask whether they are judicial activists, in which case you're going to get the answer that they will be as active as the law and the facts of the case require, no more and no less? Mm -hmm. That is the standard uh, uh, answer that is given in US Supreme Court confirmation hearings and has been since the disastrous confirmation hearings of Robert Bork in 1979 where he made the mistake of answering every question that was put to him extremely fully uh, and had to withdraw his application uh, uh, because it was quite clear that it was going to be rejected on a bipartisan basis. So what do you ask them? Do you ask them, well are you a Tory? Uh, are you a Lever? Uh, in which case you have to ask, would the present government be pleased uh, if the present uh, Supreme Court had been chosen on overtly political grounds by the Labour Party ministers who were in power between 1997 and 2010? You can't construct a constitutional settlement on the footing uh, 
uh, that the present government is going to be in power forever, much as it would doubtless like to be. Can I just go back to this point about judicial review? Because I think we have to go we have to sort of go into the question of what is the problem that the government are trying to solve. They talk about it being burdensome on policy making, in which case you have to ask, well, okay, is it that uh, what the courts do is actually out of proportion to effective policy making and a good check on policy making? Or is it that actually what the government do inside of that policy making in order to prepare for or deal with judicial review is out of proportion to what they ought to be able to do, or is it just that this is the cost of making good policy, that there are checks in the system that you should have to do equality assessments, uh, environment assessments, consultations with the public and so forth, and yes, that is burdensome. And we need to really go into, therefore, the policy-making side of it and actually look at whether or not uh, it has got out of proportion, whether or not the civil service are too risk averse, are going to ministers and saying, I'm not sure that you can do that because of judicial review down the road, or whether they can be more innovative, or whether there are ways of streamlining some of these processes, you know, really get into what the problem is, because there's clearly frustration amongst ministers, but again, is that their conception that policy making ought to be easier, but actually it's more complicated than that? Or is it just there's too much risk aversion there and we can actually solve it on the policy making side of it rather than adjusting what happens in the courts? But there's no empirical evidence of overreach in the judicial review sector. I mean, and there are actually already quite strict rules about in terms of cost and time um, and the weight of the issue to be brought before a court. And a large number get rejected. But we still hear a lot from civil yes. servants saying, oh, but we, no, we don't, it might go to but, JR, but every JR, government, so better not but go But most governments way. have a no. problem with um, when it comes to uh, you know, having their, their hands tied and control of parliament. You know. It doesn't matter which hue. So it's not, it's not as though this government are the first one, but they just seem to be going further. But I, have, I think you have to go back to the evidence, and there is very little evidence of overreach in that sector. I fundamentally disagree with that. I think that there is a, a great deal of, of evidence. Of course, it's that I'm not suggesting that judicial review always overreaches, but I don't have the slightest doubt uh, that it sometimes does. Uh, there are two particular areas where it has, I think, overreached. One is that the courts have proved particularly uh, retentive in response to attempts to curtail their own powers. Um, a very good example of this is uh, Evans, the case of the Prince of Wales's letters under the Freedom of Information Act. Um, it seems absolutely plain to me that the majority of the Supreme Court in deciding that case were mainly motivated by their disapproval of attempts uh, to make the view of a minister uh, conclusive as to what the public interest is as opposed to the view of the courts. Uh, it seems to me that on some issues it's perfectly legitimate to say that the public interest should be determined politically rather than judicially. But reverting to what you were saying a moment ago, um, we can have, and probably should have, <coughs> any number of restrictions on the scope of policy making. The question is not what restrictions there should be, but who should decide what restrictions there should mm. be. Uh, and it seems to me uh, that if limitations are going to be placed uh, on ministerial policy making, uh, it is important uh, that they should be placed uh, by a political process and not uh, a judicial one. <coughs> because the judiciary are not answerable, and rightly not answerable, for their decisions to anybody. I'm going to the hands up already. We could continue this for some time. Maybe we're going to continue it right now. All right. Um, I, I'm going to try and get in as many. I'm going to take um, three at a time. And can we start? Yes, you. I'm on the aisle. Yeah, I'll take the, um, those three, and I, I will come to you next. Uh, Joshua Rosenberg, can I pick up Lord Sumption's point about codifying public law? Uh, which I understand to mean a statute, an act of parliament. I'm not suggesting that. I'm well, saying that if, if, a, okay. Well, that. then in that case, how would you codify it, if not by an act of parliament, which would say the circumstances in which judicial review would be available? That's how I okay. do it. You hold on. Uh, on. Who, who then? Who then? The question is, who then would interpret that act of parliament? The answer is surely the judges. Um, and as Lord Sumption has said, uh, he takes the view that they got it wrong in the Evans case, Prince of Wales Letters. So uh, aren't the judges going to interpret any code in just the way that they interpret it now, 
and therefore codifying it will not solve the perceived problem of the judges going too far. Joshua, thank you. Two, let me take two more. And, and I'll come to the panel. And Vernon Bogdan or King's College London. I agree with Jonathan Sumption that the government shouldn't be hidebound by the last three years and the Constitution has worked on the whole very well over the last three years. But Brexit does raise something very fundamental for the Constitution because it's the process of disentrenchment, taking back control, if you like, and withdrawal from an international human rights regime, which is very rare, if not unprecedented in the modern world. And it brings us back to the sort of unprotected constitution we had before 1973, famously characterized by Lord Hailsham as an elective dictatorship. And it seems to me the key question which we all have to face is whether we are happy with that in a society where we now have an explicit recognition of a multinational system, a much more multicultural society than we had, and a much more multi-denominational society than we had. And if we're not happy with it, doesn't that involve giving more power to judges and not less? Thank you. And here. Paul Tucker, it seems to me that amongst the many points you've made, one could distinguish between two types of points. A set of points about who the actors are, reform of the House of Lords, whether there should be an English Parliament, I'd add to that, have we got too many independent agencies? And then a separate set of questions about the relationship between the, the, act, the actors, whoever the actors are. So, and judicial review would fall into that, but so would Henry VIII powers. So would be our rather distinctive approach to international law. Um, so would be the tribunal system, where the tribunals get into merits, but don't have to account to parliamentary committees. Whereas in the world I served, we certainly got into merits but we have to go and explain ourselves. So this goes back to Catherine's first question, which is what set of questions are we, what type of questions is the government going to be interested in? And then which subset of the two types of questions are they going to, going to tackle? And of course the two types, are, the boundaries are blurred, but I think it is useful to make, to make that distinction. All right, thanks very much. We've got Can I just say in response to Gina Miller on about the evidence, I would, to the best of my knowledge, there's a much more extensive literature in the United States about the extent to which the administrative law constrains the administrative mm. state than here. My best guess is there's almost no quantitative research that, that has been replicated and, and peer-reviewed thoroughly. So, so that all there can be is, is impressions from different um, perspectives and different degrees of experience. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, we've got codif codification, uh, Brexit and actors and the government's questions. Uh, Lord Sumption, you, would you like to start and then others chip in on... Uh, shall I address jo Joshua's question? Um, uh, obviously there is a, a danger that um, a statutory code of public law, um, uh, which is what it would have to be, uh, would be interpreted um, in an odd way by judges. But I think the danger uh, is limited. First of all, uh, a lot depends on clear drafting. Uh, I'm not advocating this, but simply looking at it as a technician, uh, an act which said that uh, so much of public law uh, as entitles uh, uh, the courts to judicially review a public body is hereby repealed and replaced by the next 250 sections uh, is the sort of technique that one would adopt. One would then have, uh, one would hope, uh, uh, drafting of impeccable clarity in, in a context which made it clear that this was a replacement of current rules uh, and not simply a supplement to be interpreted in the light of public rules. That is one reason why I am not as pessimistic as you are about this. Um, I mean, you may regard it as optimism, I don't know. Um, the other is that I think that there are changes of judicial moods and one of them is very slowly and unobtrusively taking place at the moment. Uh, the generation of judges which is uh, on its way out uh, was much more interested in asserting uh, its power, much more thrilled with the relatively new toy which the more expansive forms of judicial review and in particular the Human Rights Act has placed in their hands. The generation that is coming up at the moment is a great deal more cautious about the separation of powers. The 
publicly stated attitudes uh, of the last Supreme Court um, uh, uh, president and the current one uh, are very different indeed. Thanks very much. It's a very brief, brief, brief comment. Uh, I, I wouldn't dare to come between Joshua and Vernon. You can sort this out between yourself. But, uh, uh, Paul, uh, uh, one kind of thing which, which I've been exercised about and I haven't really thought through properly. See, I used to think that the concept of checks and balances was between institutions. And I'm beginning to realize that you've got an equal principle of checks and balances within institutions. And so, so I think we've sorted out the checks and balances probably within the Palace of Westminster. They sort of got themselves back to some equilibrium in, in that sense. And to, to, to what extent... Well, you know... But, but, we, we, we can, but in, in terms of... In, in bet, you know, with the judiciary and that relationship to the institutions, you know, I'm not clear. I was reading George Orwell over, over Christmas, and uh, because it was, a, and he said that in, in England, New England, he makes this, this thing which I need to think through a bit more. He said, you know, the English, the law may not be just, but it's above the state and incorruptible. So that was the thing why they, why, why they, they, they sort of agreed to it. And I, I think that's bits which we need to think through, but I'm quite sure the government's not thinking about any of those. <laughs> Kath. Just to go to, to Vernon's question and actually the second part of it of are we happy with that given you know, the state of society and so forth. And this goes to the, the point I was making about the beginning of the government have a choice of do they do something that's narrow and constrained or do they do something that's wide ranging, independent and in which case does it have a strong public engagement thing to actually find out what people want? And I know Graham Allen is going to speak at some point here to ask a question and he will mention citizens assemblies. And if, if you're doing them, that, that means a massive program. You know, we've just been through three years of trying to establish what it is that the public wants. We will be going, then going through another process of doing that. And how open are the governments for the public to come back with answers that are not predetermined by the government? Just going back to this point about is it the, who are the check almost on the government? Is it the judiciary through judicial review or should it be political actors? This goes to another thing that we've not really touched on, of actually do we need to sit and look at uh, Parliament and how it operates, and not just the House of Lords, but actually the House of Commons. Because if, if we follow your line of argument that it actually ought to be political actors who are that check on it, then we need much more empowerment for select committees. At the moment, it's very difficult for them to compel witnesses, to compel statements. You know, even getting the liaison committee up and running is proving a very difficult process because it takes so long after a general election. So should we have a right commission part two to actually look at the whole of Parliament and what kind of check scrutiny it is on, on the government? And hugely research. I absolutely research. agree with you. I think that we're, maybe we're looking in the wrong place at the moment because to do it properly, to go around the country and take evidence from you know, the public at every corner of the country is going to take a huge amount of time, whereas looking at the powers and the composition of select committees it's far more interesting to me from the operations of government and where scrutiny should come from. Um, but I, I do wonder, because uh, just picking up on something Vernon said, was all of this is happening against the backdrop of the actress coming back post-Brexit. Um, you know, and and uh, is this the right time? That's the other thing I wonder, with a majority government. Um, it just the timing just seems uh, strange, bearing in mind the, the bandwidth, or is it exactly the right time, depending on what the agenda is. Thank you. All right, another batch of, of, of questions. You, yes, you uh, had your hand up very early and then right over by the fireplace. Yeah, Dave Nita, lawyer and poet. Um, I just want to frame my question, my comment question, which might solicit a uh, response, um, from the perspective of an ordinary voter, citizen, resident who is interested in government and the constitution and law. And um, just to challenge some of what's been said. So the first thing I would say is that the comment, Gisela, where you said, you're surprised that they would even put it in the manifesto at this time. My response would be, how could they not, given what the government just experienced over the last three years in terms of sort of like a, almost an earthquake battering of their uh, actions. Um, challenge, of course, by Gina Miller. And which brings me to the point of um, 
Jonathan made about um, uh, the Constitution weathering the time. Now, maybe the entire, the Constitution as a whole may have weathered this, you know, the time, but I don't think in the last three years, as somebody looking on who is interested in law and government um, would uh, draw that conclusion, albeit from a very tiny sector of the Constitution, which is the way the government uh, acted and had to be challenged, which brings us to the point that Catherine made about the whole purpose is to restore trust in the public. And I think there has been a breach of trust in the public. Anybody looking on, and I think it's an elephant in the room that's been ignored, if you cannot acknowledge that looking on and seeing that the government got two decisions devastatingly wrong and that the Supreme Court had to correct it, and then that gets interpreted as meddling, uh, 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 that actually there is a duty that the government has to come back to the public, to talk about the Constitution, to talk about reform, to explain it, and to put in context that what was done on part of Gina Miller was not meddling, but actually, I mean, if it was a law society doing that, you more understand. But this was an individual, a citizen. It took somebody who is so a non-lawyer to intervene to restore. It's a constitutional so you, hero so who is so getting... You, you welcome the idea of this commission. So I welcome the idea. Because it brings these... I don't trust the motivation. I welcome yeah. the idea. Yeah. But um, I am thoroughly in favor of a, a sort of a... Uh, love letter back to the public is it's no longer a time of manifestos, but action in terms of clarifying the Constitution, okay. which maybe over centuries has been all right, yeah. but over the last three years, yeah. it has been earth-shatteringly um, uh, devastated. Who knows right. what? Who knows what else has okay. been happening without being challenged? Anyway, okay. so, so I think we're at a very critical so thanks, time, thanks, and it must be right, addressed. So let's capture that thought there. So thank, thanks very much in, indeed for that. Right over by the fireplace. And, and then there's going to be in the front. And I'm going uh, to Graham Allen, morning. convener of the Citizens' Convention on UK Democracy. Um, we will be missing an epic chance unless we make sure that citizens and the electorate and the public are a part of this, and it isn't just done at an elite level. This is all about our democracy and that they have to be involved. The question isn't if, but how. And we've done some work at the Citizens' Convention on UK Democracy about how that might work and we've sent some information and views and possibilities into, uh, fired it into number 10, hoping it's landed somewhere. Um, there are ways to do this. It needn't take several years. We can do this in a couple of years. Uh, the methods of selecting a microcosm of the UK uh, on the particular topics that government set, they have a legitimacy here with their manifesto in the recent election. So I don't think it's up to people necessarily to say we're not going to play ball unless we set the topics. But the most important thing also is to ensure that this isn't just one little effort in the failed series of attempts in the British Constitution to put things right and just put a sticking plaster on. This is an opportunity to look at everything in general in the context of a commission, in the context of people being annoyed about how our democracy has gone and about the government itself, for the first time, four political parties expressing a view that there should be a review of our democracy. So, as well as the actual issues, uh, I hope very much that the panel would agree, it's important that we leave a legacy and that this isn't just a one-off. Excuse, excuse me, I'm all for people making statements, but, but this, forgive me, this, but not long statements. I would hope the again. panel would agree that this is, as I said, yeah, uh, an important question, opportunity to actually do this on an annual or a standing commission basis or a what works in government basis so that we don't wait until the next tectonic plate movement but that we actually try to anticipate what are the good things that we can do in our democracy. Thank you very much indeed. And right here in the front. Thank you. I uh, Gina says, is it forgive, right... Forgive me, would you like to say who you are for the record? Um, John Kerr. Uh, Gina says, is it the right time? I think it depends which issue you're looking at. If you go to Edinburgh or you go to Belfast, uh, something ought to happen really very quickly. I don't think this is the problem the Prime Minister's thinking about. And I think page 48 is about punishing the courts for the prorogation decision. But it seems to me that what he should be thinking about is how to put some cement into the union. 
uh, it seems to me that the politics of Northern Ireland are likely to follow the economics and the economic unification of Ireland is going to proceed and accelerate. I think in Scotland, I do not see how you can hold out against the referendum if the Scots have another good success in their, in their election next year. So it seems to me that we are heading into a, 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 a breakup of the union. So I think, that, and I've been waiting 17 years to say this, I agree with Giesler. The, the <laughs> you come to regret this, John. <laughs> I, I think Giesler's on exactly the right issues. I think I don't agree with every word of what Robert Salisbury's paper says, but I do think it's addressing the right issues. I think issues like the composition of the House of Lords are a secondary issue. The House of Lords could play an important part in cementing union, which it doesn't really do at all at the moment. But you have first to decide the primary question. Gisela, do you want to come back on that? And then, uh, I, I, I shall pause and, 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 and cherish this moment, John. <laughs> uh, no, but um, I, I, I think the, 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 the Scotland issue, you know, the, the, I think as far as I'm concerned, if you have a, a, a good election next year, and if the SNP goes out and, for, the and Scottish for the Scottish Parliament, and if the SNP campaigns there just purely on, 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 on the referendum, uh, then it will become, the, the, the politics of the situation will become really very difficult. And that's why I think you need, to, you need to look at the structures of your institutions. And we've just spent too long arguing over uh, various bits, you know, the House of Lords or what have you, start of what it does. Similarly with the, with the voting system, you see, if, if you do a, a, a PR, then you've got between parties. If you do AV, you've got the, the most consensus candidate. If you've got first past the post, you, you by and large tend to get clear decisions. And, and I have to remind you, I think it is absolutely extraordinary that what, what the Tory party has pulled up in the last election. The tin called Tory is still there, but what's in it is completely different from what he was a few years ago. And for the first time, the Tory party is not divided over Europe. Uh, and the argument that you can't have regional parties emerging uh, if it was first past the post, you know, just, just look what the SNP did to the Labour Party in Scotland. It utterly destroyed it. So it's, it's the core, and I, I just wish, you know, we need to start by saying if you want to keep the union together, what are the components? And again, I agree with John about Northern Ireland. I think that's a, that's a different dynamics, and it will play out differently. Gina, you want to come back on? No, I, I, I think... <laughs> The, the issue, um, the, the election in Holyrood, as you say, if it's a manifesto pledge for a referendum, it's going to be very, very difficult for Westminster to deny um, Scotland that referendum. And if you look at the demographic changes in the voting age and the uh, voter sentiment compared to 2014, there's a very good possibility that they will win. I mean, it's looking in the low 60% at the moment. So. You know, that, that is a huge issue, but then you wonder how does that work in practice? I mean, th this is the problem I can't get round to, is constitutionally. Actually, I can understand Northern Ireland because of the constitution and the economics and, and how that would work, but for Scotland to be independent, it's just economically, from a legal point of view, from a constitutional point of view, from a travel point of view, from a border point of view, there are so many questions that need, it's all very well asking a political question, but what about the details? How will it actually work in practice? And I'm not sure that that will be discussed in any um, a manifesto in an election, <laughs> you know, next year in Hollywood. So they, it is a very dangerous time, I think, for our constitution and for the question of Scotland. So union, <laughs> again, John, I'll join you. I, mean, I actually agree with Gisela. I mean, um, just, just pick up these points. On the one hand, we have these union questions, which are, I and my colleagues absolutely agree with you, are oh, big, urgent, are going to thrust themselves at, at, the, at the government. On the other hand, you've got a real difference of opinion there. The government yeah. does not want the breakup of the union. Um, Nicholas Sturgeon does uh, in, in, in that sense. And I wonder whether a commission is both, um, whether it's right to even talk of putting those issues into this commission, which, as I said, is in danger of becoming a, a, a bucket, um, and, and whether it needs something else. But also we've had two questions essentially about bringing people's voices into this, and indeed whether it can be done quickly, whether it can be done every year, um, um, something that is uh, sprawling as we are talking about it. 
Lord Sumption. I think, you? I mean, you're trying to warn us off Scotland, and I'm going to ignore no, 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 the warning no, no, if you no, don't no, mind. No, 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 I'm not at all. I'm, I I'm, just, I'm, can I just make a, a small number of points that don't seem to be very often made? One, the government holds all the cards on Scotland because constitutional issues are not devolved issues. And so long as the government keeps its nerve uh, and remains in power, it can postpone a second referendum indefinitely. There is no such thing as political pressure which they can't resist, uh, except the possibility of Scottish UDI. That, as Nicola Sturgeon has recognised, is a complete non-starter because an illegal Scottish government would not get into the EU, would not be able to borrow and would not be able to do most of the things they want to do. Uh, secondly, um, Brexit has made uh, Scottish independence, it seems to me, a great deal more problematical uh, than it otherwise would have been. If Scotland were to join the EU, there would be a hard border along the Tweed, and that would create a problem for a country, 77% of whose exports are to the United Kingdom. Um, thirdly, the Scottish nationalists are in the process of making exactly the same mistake uh, as everybody else made about the Brexit referendum. There was no precise proposal. Uh, instead, you had left to Parliament the business of working out what the terms would be. Um, uh, so what they want is a referendum before any terms of separation have been agreed between England and Scotland. That would be a disaster on a scale at least as great as the one which we've just spent three and a half years not entirely successfully trying to solve. Finally, ultimate theoretical thought, we all have two nationalities. We are English in my case and British. I reject the suggestion uh, that it is a purely a matter for the Scots to decide whether they should be independent. To my mind, if somebody is going to break up my country, Britain, uh, I think that I should have a say in it just as much uh, as, as any Scot, uh, Scotland being as much part of my country uh, as Yorkshire is. Thank you for that. I thought in the middle, <laughs> in the middle, you were going to say that the Prime Minister can stall the Scottish question, but does not have the same power under the Belfast Agreement on the Northern uh, Irish question. He doesn't question. have the same power. Yeah. So that's um, up, but that's Northern an, Ireland is a different. Yeah, of which fish. is which is at one for another day. And we're going to have to finish really soon. I want to catch uh, Kath's last thoughts on all these things, including bringing in lots of people. Uh, well, I think yes. the fact that there are so many different views just on the panel itself shows the difficulty in designing a commission like this. I'd just like to finish, actually, on this, this question that seems to be coming backwards and forwards of, is this the, the right moment, the epic chance, as, as Graham put it, uh, or is it the very, really the wrong moment because so much is in flux? And I think this is the crux of it, and I'm not sure that you can rec reconcile those two things with, you know, sort of ongoing uh, next phase of trade negotiations with every, all the discussion that's going to happen around the union over the course of the next year but also we're so early into a new government that will become distracted by all sorts of new policies and this is the one thing why I, I, I you know I know it's a sort of you know niche I issue in a way but why I come back to design oftentimes whether it's commissions or inquiries or anything like that when they're set up it's all in a flurry of enthusiasm about what they should do but very little thought about the lifespan of them and the fact that the picture is very different at the end when they report than when they start. And if you're going to design something like this, it has to be able to fluctuate throughout that whole period, which is why it needs to involve the devolved nations, why it needs to have cross-party support, and why perhaps actually a parliamentary commission, something that understands the sort of political ebb and flow, would probably be a better place to be discussing these issues. We are really sadly going to have to stop there, and I'm sorry because there are uh, lots of hands up and more going up as we were talking, quite understandably, uh, because this is a rich subject and going to go on for some time. I don't think in any way we have cracked it or wrapped it up, and the question that hangs in my mind after all this is, is, is this a very nice, sharp one at the beginning of why did the government do this uh, and put this in the manifesto? Was it just to give it... Uh, uh, cover. Exactly uh, yeah. <laughs> right, go on. They, they did it because they yeah. didn't expect to have a majority of 80. They thought they might yeah. be in for years more of yeah. the kind of problems they've yeah. had for the last three years, and they wished to stuff as many alternative sources of power as possible. Or alternatively, <laughs> did they think they would have a majority and intended to uh, um, uh, uh, get what they want uh, done? Um, to be continued, many, many thanks indeed for coming. Please join me in thanking our terrific panel.